we've been talking in the last couple of lectures about the uh, the history of the uh, the U.S. cattle industry in the 19th century. Something that really took off in a big way at the end of the Civil War uh, and flourished for about uh, 20 years uh, there, during which time uh, an open range system was used by by most ranchers, which is to say that they allowed their herds to just kind of wander freely. And then in the spring, uh, when it was time for branding and uh, taking some to market, why well, they would go find them, round them up in the spring roundup. Uh, and that lasted, uh, like I said, for about 20 years until, as we discussed, the uh, the big uh, uh, blizzard of 1886-87 of that winter, which put the kibosh on the open range system because it uh, it proved it to be unsustainable. Uh, that led to uh, enclosure of the range and, and barbed wire. Now, um, it's kind of uh, uh, almost um, anticlimactic to think that a lot of the stuff we've been talking about basically comes down to government land policy. But it does. I know that sounds boring, and it can be, but it can also lead to some very dramatic results, as we've seen. So that, uh, that land policy, uh, starting in 1862 with the passage of the Homestead Act, was that public lands, that is, lands that were owned and controlled by the federal government, uh, west of the Mississippi, and these are lands that were gained in the Louisiana Purchase, that were taken from Mexico in the U.S.-Mexican War, and some others, that uh, those lands could be settled by U.S. citizens going west uh, if, uh, if they claimed a plot of land, a section of land, a section being 160 acres, and all they had to do was file a claim at the land office in the nearest, uh, nearest town, pay a small fee, and within five years prove that they had made improvements to the land, that they had built stuff on it, and that they were using it. Um, this obviously led to a lot of people taking advantage of this opportunity. Uh, including a lot of immigrants uh, recently arrived to the country, headed west uh, to make claims to this public land. Public land which the ranchers, especially the big ranchers, had been using uh, to graze their herds for decades and which they had come to think of as belonging to them. What lands are we talking about? Well, let's take a look at this very helpful map of improved land in 1880. So in this map, every individual dot represents 25,000 acres that have been quote unquote improved, or in other words, that are being used, meaning that they're being lived upon, uh, that uh, uh, homesteads have been built there, uh, perhaps ranches are there, that uh, that, that have ranch houses and so forth, uh, small ranches. And uh, as you can see, there's a whole lot of those things in uh, clustered there in, in Illinois and northern Missouri um, and uh, up, uh, up into Iowa. Uh, huge, huge number, as well as a whole lot in the, uh, the northeast. Uh, all of those things that uh, that have uh, shown up there in the Midwest, well, not all of them, but the vast majority of them are, are farms. Remember that discussion that we had about the transportation revolution and the market revolution and that particular area, once called the Old Northwest, uh, being uh, uh, opened up to a lot of, a lot of settlement. Uh, you will notice there Oklahoma is a big empty spot. That's because that's Indian territory, not technically the uh, the United States at that time. Uh, so uh, there's plenty of dots there in the eastern part from the five quote unquote civilized tribes, but they're not reflected in this map. Now you'll notice, well, there's still plenty over in uh, California, especially central and northern California, which had a lot of uh, 
population growth as a result of the uh, the gold rush uh, in the early 1850s. But you'll notice a big chunk of the American West hardly has any dots on it at all. Now, uh, like I said, these dots do not represent single individual farms, but rather 25,000 acres. Now, any one of these dots might contain a large number of farms that are built close together. But nonetheless, there's a whole lot of empty space. And that empty space essentially was the uh, public lands we're talking about that were gained by the U.S. government, uh, either from uh, conquest of the indigenous tribes, which we talked about how that unfolded in the uh, 1870s, actually, uh, or various other uh, factors that we that we discussed, like the uh, Mexican-American War and so forth. So big chunk of open land not being lived on by any individuals. Now let's compare that map with uh, this other one here on the right that we looked at last time. A map that shows uh, prime cattle country in the U.S. and in, in the West, or at the very least that shows where the grasslands are, which is uh, where the areas are that are, that are good for uh, having cattle. So there's some green areas there in the West, especially in the uh, Pacific Northwest, but as you can see, vast majority of it is yellow, uh, which means that it's grasslands. And if you uh, kind of compare that, uh, measure that up with the map on the left of, uh, uh, you could say population uh, of, of improved land, you'll see that by 1880, there's quite a few people living in Eastern Kansas and Nebraska, mostly farmers, also some ranchers, but hardly any land being used in Western Kansas and Western Nebraska, much less west of there until you get to until you get to California. It's almost like there's a line there. Uh, we'll make it a dotted line through Oklahoma because it's sort of a, a thing unto itself. But uh, like there is a line there between the settled areas and the unsettled areas, most of which are going to be public land and aren't entirely unsettled, but there's huge swaths of those uh, empty yellow spaces that are being used to, uh, to herd cattle uh, by, by ranchers uh, who've been in the practice of doing that, perhaps since they, since they got started. Now, this is, this is an interesting development because uh, a lot of those larger ranchers like the Wyoming, Wyoming Stock Growers Association that we talked about, they feel like the land belongs to them but technically it doesn't. Uh, technically it's public land. They're using land that they don't actually have title to. Now, some of the settlers who came westward might have been squatters uh, who just sort of illegally uh, showed up and built a home or started a farm, but not most of them, and particularly not post-Civil War because of that Homestead Act. Uh, most of them came through there and, in fact, filed a claim. Uh, and then they had to, quote unquote, prove up that claim after five years. Right. But this is what's uh, this is what's ironic. The uh, the ranchers in these uh, these range war situations are trying to clear out the small farmers and the small ranchers as being interlopers coming to land that the uh, the larger ranchers had long controlled. But the fact is. It's the interlopers who actually have the legal rights, uh, who have the title to those lands. By the way, a side point, I teach this class, which is called U.S. Westward Expansion, but I also teach a, teach a class about the, uh, the Western genre. I call it the frontier in the American imagination which is more about the history of the myth of the West than about the actual history. And in that class, I show a lot of Western films like, like this one, this, this classic Shane from the 1950s, uh, 
uh, which, by the way, uh, I could also show in my environmental history class because it's all about the importance of land and water. Anyhow, the first time that I showed this uh, film and films like it, I was surprised to, to, to get the response when I was reading the, uh, the papers. Uh, my class, you can't just sit back and watch. Uh, how many students were confused by some of the terminology um, as though they had never heard the terms before, like sodbuster. Uh, a couple of students had a hard time working out exactly what that means, uh, which tells me they haven't worked on a farm. A sodbuster is literally what it sounds like, somebody that busts up the sod by plowing. And usually they don't wear cowboy boots, they wear clodhoppers or, or work shoes, uh, or are called clodhoppers themselves. Anyway, I digress. Here is another good map that shows public land in the 21st century. And as you can see, most of it is still in the American West. So the orange parts there, those are the areas uh, technically controlled by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, which means that they are reservations. Uh, there's also the really dark green areas that are controlled by the National Park Service, the lighter green areas controlled by the National Forest Service, and all that yellow area controlled by the Bureau of Land Management, uh, or BLM. So today, those areas, particularly those yellow areas, are still public lands. And here's another good map that shows all the stuff we just looked at, plus also includes the areas controlled by the Fish and Wildlife Services, which uh, you can see there in southern Georgia. There's uh, some spots there in Arizona, uh, in Nevada. That little square there in Nevada, if I'm not mistaken, is an area that's uh, set aside as a reserve for an endangered species of tortoise and a few little flecks here and there. Although, once you get up into Alaska, as you can see, it's a, it's a patchwork so far as federal agencies that are involved. Now, as we discussed when we talked about the Johnson County War, which culminated in 1892, um, the U.S. Army had to be called in. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was all over the papers, all over the country, but the uh, Wyoming Stock Growers Association members never really had any uh, uh, legal price to pay for their activities. And in fact, you know, they uh, continued riding roughshod uh, over, over the countryside and controlling things due to their control of the uh, politics in Wyoming, in this case, and the, uh, uh, the economics. However, the 1890s, as we will discuss a little bit later, was also the uh, the peak of the populist movement that uh, was a movement in which a whole lot of farmers and uh, workers got fed up with um, a lot of the uh, the wealthy elite in the country and started pushing back. And that led right into the progressive era, which started around 1900 with with Teddy Roosevelt. So even though those cattle barons seemed to still be in firm control of public lands in the West in the 1880s, things were about to change. As discussed, filing claims for those public lands was done through the, uh, through the land office. And in fact, the United States General Land Office was a... Uh, uh, a division of the U.S. government that was established way back in 1812 in the final year of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. And if you'll think back to our discussions about Thomas Jefferson uh, many lectures ago, uh, he had that agrarian ideal, right? The idea that small farmers are the backbone of, of the country, small self-sustaining farms. So he was very much in favor of uh, individual farmers being able to move west and get access to land. So that's when the uh, land office started. 
And then in 1849, when the U.S. Department of the Interior was formed, the land office was placed under the auspices of the Department of the Interior. By the 1890s, there were a couple of individuals on the scene who were going to be extraordinarily influential uh, and impactful to uh, the country as a whole, but also to the uh, to the West in decades to come. Uh, the first one we'll talk about Theodore or Teddy Roosevelt, who was from New York City, from a uh, a very uh, wealthy family, very old money, um, who uh, had kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, back background by the 1890s. He was he was from New York City. He eventually by the early 1890s was the chief of police of New York City, uh, but he had also spent a lot of time out west prior to the 1890s when he was a younger man uh, and, uh, in fact, had written a history of the American West. Now, if you know uh, about Teddy Roosevelt, you know that uh, when he was a kid, he was very sickly, uh, wasn't allowed to go outside a whole lot. Uh, when he grew up, he sort of... Um, yeah, you might almost say overcompensated for that by being extremely outdoorsy, going on safaris to Africa, going out west to work on ranches for fun. Here's a photograph of him uh, when he was 25 years old doing that. Uh, and uh, he, he ascribed his experience, particularly in the rugged west, as part of the reason that he was able to uh, to overcome his sickly nature and he believed that everybody needed to get out of the city and get out into the wilderness and test themselves against the elements and, and against the nature and toughen themselves up and in order to do that there had to be nature uh, left to do that in so he was very very concerned about the uh, availability of uh, of lands controlled by the, the government that could be available to the public in the future uh, for, uh, for recreation, basically. The second person that uh, I was referring to was uh, this guy, Gifford Pinchot, sometimes pronounced Pinchot, who was around the same age as Roosevelt, who was uh, from the same part of the country. He was from Connecticut. Uh, when he graduated from college, I think he went to Yale, um, he embarked on a career as a, in, in forestry. And he actually rose uh, pretty high and pretty quickly through the uh, government ranks in the, uh, the secretary, in the uh, department rather, of, of agriculture. Now, he and Roosevelt are going to be big pals, particularly once Roosevelt becomes president in 1901. The two of them very quickly became titans in the movement that uh, soon became known as conservationism. Now, a conservationist uh, is not against the development of land or the use of land. A conservationist wants to use land and even develop it in such a way that it is sustainable. In other words, use uh, natural resources, but use them in such a way that you are not going to run out of them and that they can be replaced. It also, um, in Roosevelt's case, uh, applied to his, uh, his, his propensity to, to form new national parks, kind of to pursue uh, his goal of having places uh, that were wilderness areas for, for people to be able to go and see. Uh, Pinchot uh, became eventually Roosevelt's head of the Forestry Service. Conservationism is very similar to and has similar goals to, but is not quite the same thing as the movement uh, that was uh, exemplified in this guy. John Muir, also coming on the scene in the 1890s, uh, a Scottish immigrant who was enamored of the natural beauty of the uh, American West. He would become co-founder of the uh, Sierra Club. Uh, 
And he would become what is known as a preservationist, which differs from conservationism in that a preservationist wants to set aside an area and keep it exactly the way that it is with no changes made to it at all, just pure nature. Uh, which actually uh, that has a caveat to it because all these people were not factoring in the indigenous people who often already lived in those areas and who had often uh, been structuring uh, nature around themselves for years. Anyhow, uh, John Muir and uh, Gifford Pinchot are going to be uh, friends and allies for a while, uh, but eventually they have a falling out that uh, hinges on the Hetch Hetchy Dam in, in California. Uh, Pincho was uh, in favor of that and pushed that through uh, so as to build a hydroelectric dam, which flooded an entire valley that, uh, that Muir thought was one of the most beautiful places in the world. And that, that demonstrates the difference between these two movements. Conservationists willing to change things, willing to use up resources, well, use them without using them up. So uh, Pinchot uh, wound up uh, eventually by uh, uh, the, uh, the 1890s um, becoming the head of the fourth person to be the head of the Bureau of, or the Division, the Division of Forestry. Division of Forestry was established uh, in 1881. In 1901, it was renamed the Bureau of Forestry. And then in 1905, under President Roosevelt, uh, it was uh, renamed again the U.S. Forest Service, uh, the name by which it still exists today. So in its current incarnation, uh, 123 plus years on, uh, the uh, U.S. Forest Service, their first director was, was Pinchot, appointed by Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt also transferred the uh, uh, responsibility for administering the nation's forest reserves from the U.S. Land Office to the U.S. Forest Service. Now, the Forest Service uh, is not part of the Department of the Interior. It is part of the Department of Agriculture. Well, by 1906, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, again under the direction of Roosevelt and Pinchot, uh, introduced something new to public lands in the West, grazing fees. So if these ranchers want to graze their cattle on public land, they're going to have to pay to do it. Now, the fee that they would have to pay was uh, just a fraction of what they would be charged by uh, a private uh, uh, individuals uh, on the average. But still, it was uh, required payment uh, and this is a big part of that conservation movement. It's a big part of progressivism. The U.S. government being more directly involved, for one thing, that's a big progressive uh, aspect, and trying to protect uh, the, uh, the grasslands that were being overused. Uh, so uh, that, uh, that starts happening, and then that is going to theoretically put an end to those uh, situations that had developed in the late 19th century of these cattle barons uh, essentially having control over huge swaths of public land that they didn't actually own. Now, the big problem with this was that uh, the Forest Service started charging fees, but they weren't really set up to do anything about it if you didn't pay them. That came almost 30 years later, and it came from Congress with the passing of the Taylor Grazing Act in 1934. And this was a direct response to the Dust Bowl. Now, uh, the, the Dust Bowl was a situation that developed in the 1930s uh, 
that was sort of a combination of a bunch of different factors. The Dust Bowl was this area in the Great Plains, which basically covered almost all of the Great Plains, in the 1930s, when there were several years of drought, uh, and uh, this was during the Great Depression, so, you know, adding insult to injury, uh, drought that led to a lot of the uh, soil in the Great Plains um, just uh, drying up and blowing away. A lot of people lost their farms, although you could say they didn't really lose them because you could look up into the sky and there they were. Um, there were uh, black blizzards, uh, huge, huge dust storms. Uh, so a lot of people, particularly in that uh, kind of uh, uh, reddish brown area that was kind of the, uh, uh, the, the central point there, a lot of people uh, lost their livelihood, lost their homes, and wound up uh, with nothing, and, and wound up moving away. Uh, many of them headed for California uh, because uh, they had heard that there were jobs there, uh, picking fruit uh, mostly, uh, and uh, when they got there, discovered that they weren't very welcome by the uh, Californians, uh, dadgum Midwesterners out here trying to take our jobs, uh, referred to them disparagingly as Okies, even though um, all of them weren't from Oklahoma. In fact, most of them were not from Oklahoma. You can see the areas where they were from. Now, you may have, uh, you may have seen, uh, for example, this famous photograph uh, here on the left of a uh, a homeless uh, Oki family uh, just arrived in, in California. Or you might be aware uh, that there was a novel about Okies and the Dust Bowl uh, that was, uh, well, it's now considered one of the great novels of the 20th century, the, the Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck, which was made into a film not long after the book came out starring uh, Henry Fonda as the main character, Tom Joad. Um, maybe, you've, uh, maybe you're familiar with the Bruce Springsteen album, the whole album called The Ghost of, of Tom Joad. Anyhow, uh, all this, uh, this series of events taking place, like I said, during the Great Depression was much like, uh, uh, much like the situation with the... Uh, the big die up, um, not entirely uh, due just to to the weather, but due in large part also to the way that people had been doing things that had uh, helped to set up this situation. Let's take a look at this familiar map from earlier that shows improved land as of 1880. Now remember, improved land is essentially land with something built on it. So uh, this is a lot of farms, but it also includes urban areas. Uh, so 1880, uh, let's see how it changes uh, over the next couple of decades from 1880 to 1890 to 1900. Uh, you can see that that's uh, quite a bit of, uh, of increase in improved land uh, creeping westward. A lot of that was due to the immigrants, immigrants with an I and also immigrants with an E, uh, headed west to take advantage of the Homestead Act and to stake claims, you know, to a, uh, a section of land, start their own individual farms. But uh, it was also affected by the big die up, those, those blizzards in the late 1880s, which uh, killed off uh, a pretty uh, hefty percentage of, of the cattle that were in the West and uh, both opened up uh, more land for, for uh, grazing land to be converted to, to farmlands and, and also at the same time encouraged some ranchers to diversify and, and uh, plant some things uh, on, on some, of, uh, some of their land. This map doesn't show the total amount of improved land. It shows uh, 
the uh, amount of new improved land uh, between 1910 and 1920. So that would be on top of what was already there. And in this case, it's uh, 5,000 uh, acre units that we're looking at. But you can still get the idea here that quite a bit of, uh, of newly improved acreage in the 19 teens. And finally, this map shows the, uh, the, the total amount of farmland, basically, in the United States in 1929. Acreage of harvested crops, and it's going back to the uh, 25,000 acre units. Uh, so uh, essentially, so far as areas being farmed, this is what you're looking at at the very beginning of the Great Depression. Notice, compared to 50 years earlier, how much farming was going on in the Great Plains. Quite a bit, right? In fact, look how much is going on right here in the Llano Estacado, the Staked Plains, that area where Quanah Parker had had his hideout uh, 50 years, uh, 50, 60 years earlier. This area that uh, had a reputation as being uh, a featureless, uh, almost almost desert. Uh, quite a bit of farming going on there as well. Here's a map showing average rainfall in the United States, or perhaps uh, average precipitation would be more accurate. Um, probably doesn't surprise you to see that once you hit the Great Plains, it starts getting drier and then gets, uh, you know, uh, increasingly drier as you go west for the most part, except up in the mountains. Uh, essentially here, once you get into uh, central Kansas and Oklahoma, once you get past there and onto the actual plains, then the annual rainfall is roughly about one third what it is in, uh, for example, the American South or in New England. So significantly drier, also, uh, there are fewer rivers uh, in uh, the, the farther west you go here, and they tend to be broader and more shallow. Um, so just, just overall, dry conditions. And here is a map showing the primary form of vegetation across the United States. As you can see, east of the Mississippi and even a little bit west of the Mississippi there in uh, most of uh, uh, Missouri and, and Arkansas and in Louisiana, uh, forested areas uh, is the primary type of uh, vegetation. But once you get uh, there to uh, say Kansas, uh, a little ways into, uh, into Oklahoma, past East Texas, then you enter that brown area, that light brown area, which is grasslands. So the, uh, the little dots, those are the grasslands that are tall grass or prairie. And then the, uh, the part without the dots is uh, uh, short grass areas or steppes. All right, then, you know, as you can see, as you go farther west, you've got forests on the mountains and then you've got a lot of desert area. But the Great Plains, you've got, for the most part, prairie. In fact, the covered wagons on which uh, many settlers, many settlers headed west, were sometimes referred to as prairie schooners. Uh, a schooner is a type of ship. Uh, so they were called that because the prairie, especially there in those uh, either flat or gently, very gently rolling lands, looked like a great sea of grass and these wagons looked like and felt like uh, ships sailing across the sea. Now here's our old friend, the American bison or buffalo. I wanna share something interesting uh, with you about buffalo, prairie, and grass. There have been studies in recent years, uh, studies that compared sections of prairie that were grazed by buffalo, who are, of course, making a controlled comeback, thankfully, uh, 
uh, sections grazed by cattle and sections not grazed by any large animals at all. And what they've discovered is that when you turn the buffalo loose on the prairie, that um, the richness of native plant species increases by about 86% uh, over ungrazed land. So almost doubles in the diversity of native plants. Uh, several reasons uh, possible for, for this happening. Uh, one reason is that uh, buffalo uh, have a, a, a very sort of selective way of, of eating the, the grass. Um, they, uh, it's, it's called a keystone herbivory. Uh, which is not a word that I'm uh, a term that uh, you know I'm naturally familiar with, not being a biologist. But uh, the buffalo selectively graze four main grass species that um, tends to proliferate in an ungrazed, the ungrazed sections, right? So so let's think about that. There are certain grasses buffalo-like, so they eat them down. If the buffalo aren't there, those four grasses take over. So uh, by kind of controlling that and preventing those grasses from dominating, it creates more of a balance of grasses, which leads to more diversity. Uh, also, uh, buffalo uh, tend to wallow, or as we say around here, to waller. Uh, a buffalo wallow. Uh, is a place where the buffalo just uh, roll around in the grass uh, over and over again, a favorite spot to roll around in that kind of creates little dips in in the soil, uh, which collect rainwater uh, when it when it rains. It's it's kind of dry, but when it does rain, you've got puddles that collect that uh, make that water more available. So between the different types of grasses and the greater availability of rainwater, you've got also an increase in the variety of insects that are going to be in the area. And a greater variety of insects leads to a greater variety of small mammals that are attracted to the area uh, to eat the plants, and in some cases, uh, uh, birds to eat the insects, and so everything comes into balance. It's almost as though those American bison had been part of that uh, ecosystem for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and it had sort of developed in such a way that everything worked together. Now, when you have no buffalo, but you do have cattle, uh, there is still uh, some of that. Uh, but instead of an 86% increase, it's a 30% increase. So about a third as much uh, of a positive effect from having cattle as opposed to having bison. So stop and think about the, uh, the impact when those buffalo were almost rendered extinct. They're no longer there. There's cattle there. And in some cases, there's not cattle, but there's a lot of farming going on. Well, that is going to decrease the biodiversity of the region and make things work less well. All right, so you add to that situation, that is the absence of the buffalo, add to that overgrazing by cattle. Uh, so, yes, quite a few died off in the late uh, late 1880s, but over the next two or three decades, those numbers came back. Remember, uh, we talked about those cattle barons kind of consolidating a lot of the land and increasing their herds significantly. So you got that going on. You've also got more and more farming going on on the prairie in the Great Plains and Here's the problem. Remember, we looked at all those maps showing how dry it is and showing how grassy it is. Uh, these folks who are coming across the Mississippi into the West 
are either from east of the Mississippi or they have uh, crossed the ocean from Europe to come to the United States. So if they were already here because they were born here, probably their ancestors came over from Europe. And there were farming methods that people had been using for centuries in northern and western Europe that still work fairly well uh, east of the Mississippi in the United States. But once you cross that Mississippi and go just a little ways and you get into that arid uh, area, uh, that arid grassland area, those farming methods no longer are as effective. However, most people didn't really give that much thought. They just kept doing things the way they had always done them. Uh, despite the fact there's not as much rain, there was actually a common belief in the late 19th and early 20th century that if you converted prairie land into farmland, that would cause there to be more rain, which, you know, looking back, that may not have been such a great idea. There were also people as early as the 1870s, uh, naturalists, scientists, who were uh, giving out a warning uh, of the desertification of the West uh, that uh, actually, instead of improving the land by making all these changes, uh, they were setting it up uh, for, for a big fall uh, and uh, were, you know, in the process, uh, potentially, eventually, of turning it into a desert. So, uh, one of the things uh, that farmers did uh, that uh, they had always done before in other places was when they're plowing the land, they would plow these straight furrows and they would plow them really deep. Okay, so that, uh, that deep plowing does a couple of things. It, it loosens up the soil, by the way, on the prairie, because there are not a lot of tree breaks, it gets pretty windy. It loosens up the soil, but it also um, supplants, uh, intentionally, they intentionally supplanted the native grasses. Uh, and so they started planting grasses that uh, cattle like better than what buffalo like, but that were not native to the area. But here's a problem. Those native grasses, which had developed in the area, uh, over uh, a very, very long period of time, those native grasses held the soil together. They anchored the soil. And so when you plow real deep and you dig those up uh, and uh, you try to replace them with uh, uh, non-native grasses, what you wind up, what you wind up with is a whole lot of unanchored soil. And then, at the end of World War I, things kicked into overdrive in a couple of different ways. The, uh, uh, the first way was the introduction of, of mechanized uh, farming, uh, gas-powered uh, farming of vehicles, tractors, uh, mechanical harvesters, combine har combines, as they're called, which... Uh, enabled uh, a large area to be farmed without a whole lot of labor required, uh, by which I mean not a lot of people required. So uh, now, if you had the wherewithal to purchase a bunch of these types of things uh, and you were able to accumulate the land, you could hire a comparatively small group of people to work those things and you could be producing a whole lot of produce, which is what you produce, right? Uh, at the same time, at the end of World War I, much of Europe was devastated. Uh, a lot of people were starving there, and there was a huge market for American wheat, which uh, actually is not that different, if you recall from our earlier discussion, about a century before this, 
at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, there was a huge demand for uh, American wheat in Europe. So this uh, incentivizes uh, people, uh, uh, particularly corporations who have the wherewithal to buy up smaller farms to do so and greatly just um, uh, by uh, exponential uh, amounts increase the amount of acreage that's being farmed. Okay. Now, one other thing that happens right after World War I is the Progressive Era ends. Progressive Era was 1900 to 1920. It was the presidencies of Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Woodrow Wilson. The Progressive Era was marked by uh, active government, uh, kind of with uh, Teddy kind of setting the pace there, being a trust buster, a monopoly buster. Uh, an active government making a lot of regulations and employing a lot of experts uh, to sort of prognosticate the best way to do things. Uh, and that led to a lot of regulations on the banking and finance industry during the Progressive Era. Also, uh, a lot of regulations on land use and water use. However, when the Progressive Era ended, for various reasons, man, we could talk about that for uh, hours and hours and hours, but essentially there was a there was a big swing in the public mood and public sentiment away from those uh, progressive approaches and toward more conservative approaches uh, that also were very, very pro business. And when that happens, you see a lot of deregulation. So a lot of those rules that were put in place about banking and about land use were rolled back and people just uh, went into overdrive in trying to produce wealth by whatever means. So it was sort of like a, a big pendulum swing back toward the Gilded Age after taking about a 20 year break to try things differently. Well, uh, there's a book by Donald Worcester that's still probably the best book about the Dust Bowl. It's called The Dust Bowl. Uh, and in it, he makes the argument that the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression happening at the same time was not a coincidence. They were both sort of the indirect result, in some cases the direct result, of this uh, 1920s attitude of let's make as much money as we can any way that we can and just, uh, like I said, pump that into overdrive. And that expedited the collapse of the financial system and also expedited the circumstances that were in place that were going to lead to this large amounts of that unanchored soil after a couple of dry years and a whole lot of wind just blowing away and uh, resulting in huge dust storms that killed people that were visible uh, in Washington DC and New York City in some cases uh, very visible to the extent that uh, a couple of times uh, you could not see the Statue of Liberty if you were looking out uh, over the harbor. Uh, so this is during the uh, during the Depression. If you know your U.S. history, you know there's another Roosevelt in the White House, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and that uh, he is going to be returning to more progressive policies, which include a more active government getting involved in things, more regulations, and more reliance uh, again on experts, even more so than before. A lot of uh, reliance on uh, economic experts and agricultural, uh, biological, ecological experts to try to, uh, uh, to, try to address the problems exemplified in the Dust Bowl. Those problems including uh, both problematic uh, farming techniques and overgrazing. Which brings us back full circle 
to the Taylor Grazing Act of 1934. That act resulted in the formation of a whole new office, the U.S. Grazing Service, uh, just like the, uh, the General Land Office under the auspices of the Department of the Interior. Uh, that was in 1936, and the, uh, the U.S. Grazing Service replaced the U.S. Forest Service so far as uh, administering those grazing fees. And in 1946, another act of Congress, this time combining the U.S. Grazing Service with the U.S. General Land Office into something completely new. The Bureau of Land Management, or the BLM. So the uh, U.S. Grazing Service and the U.S. General Land Office ceased to exist as of 1946. And this new entity, the BLM, uh, took over the, uh, uh, the, the responsibilities of both of those services, including administering grazing fees. And it is still... The, uh, the, the government office which does that. So today, under the Department of the Interior, you have the Bureau of Land Management, you have the National Park Service, you have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and you have the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You have a lot of other offices as well, but these are the ones that we have uh, talked about so far in this lecture. Meanwhile, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, still alive and going strong and still under the Department of Agriculture, not the Department of the Interior. And there's one more act of Congress to, uh, to mention, at least on this topic, the Public Rangelands Improvement Act of 1978, which was signed into law by President Carter. And uh, since, that, uh, since that law was passed, Congress sets certain regulations and limits on grazing fees. Now, the BLM is still in charge of administering those fees and adjusting those fees year by year. But there are some limitations imposed by, imposed by Congress. For example, there is a minimum AUM, or animal unit, monthly, which I think is now a dollar and 34 cents, somewhere around there. So uh, it can't go below that. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the AUM uh, price cannot increase from one year to the next by more than 25%. So that if, for example, your grazing fees are uh, an even $2 AUM this year. Next year, they cannot go higher than $2.50. Now, uh, we have covered in this one lecture roughly about a century of land policy, and we've kind of run the gamut from free open-range ranching to uh, increased government regulation of ranching even, and perhaps uh, particularly, on public lands, which um, echoes into the 21st century in some interesting ways. Now, this may all seem like old history, which is most of what history is, but it all kind of comes together, or it all kind of came together uh, just about a decade ago from the time that I'm recording this, which is in 2024. And it did so in the person of this guy, Cliven Bundy. In uh, 2014, Cliven Bundy was, uh, I think, 68 years old, and uh, he had, and still has, a, a ranch down in the southern tip of Nevada. This is a ranch that was established by his parents when they moved over from nearby Arizona when Clive and Bundy was uh, two years old, I think, 19, 1948. The ranch itself <clears throat> is 160 acres, which is a section, a section of land. However, for, for a long time, uh, the, uh, the herds, uh, 
that are associated with the ranch and the Bundys have uh, have grazed not just on that 160 acres, but on many, many nearby acres that are public land down there in southern Nevada. Bundy inherited the ranch when he was 35 years old in 1981 and uh, continued his, uh, his father's uh, practice of using public lands to graze the herd and paying the grazing fee. Um, you can see year by year what the AUM was on that, and so I was mistaken a moment ago. I, I thought it was $1.34, but I think it must have been $1.35. So anyhow, dutifully paid his grazing fees for a dozen years until 1993, uh, whereupon he stopped paying out of, um, uh, out of a principled stand. He had come to the conclusion by 1993 that the federal government has no constitutional right or authority to regulate ranching on public lands because they're public and they belong to everybody. Uh, and if anyone were going to uh, regulate or control them, it would be the states, not the federal government. Um, this was around the time, uh, I think it was the, the following year after, part of those lands were set aside as a, as a tortoise reserve. We talked about that earlier. So they could no longer be used by the people who, who had been... Uh, uh, leasing the use of them uh, by paying these paying these fees. Uh, Bundy, in fact, by 1993 had become very, very. I'm not. I'm not sure how you would even describe his uh, political stance. Very far to the right, perhaps you might describe it as uh, libertarian. There's a strong libertarian streak in the Southwest, uh, but definitely not believing in the authority of the federal government. In fact, um, he eventually became part of what's known as the sovereign state movement, which believes that the, the highest office in the United States is the office of county sheriff. Uh, and uh, what the county sheriff says goes regardless of what the state or federal governments say. So Bundy stopped paying um, for uh, about 20 years, and uh, he was uh, he was given several court orders uh, ordering him to uh, uh, to pay, uh, which he uh, continued to ignore. Meanwhile, uh, the uh, the costs were racking up, even as his herd was growing. Um, the uh, the principle generally, uh, uh, so far as uh, late fees go, uh, are that if, if you are if you are late, then then you have to pay not the regular AUM, but the AUM on for private uh, grazing lands in the state in which you live, which usually is about four or five times higher than uh, what's charged by the government for public lands, which is why so many ranchers use public lands, right? So anyway, uh, this is all adding up. Uh, interest is accruing plus uh, court fines and fees so that by 2012, Clive and Bundy owed more than a million dollars in unpaid grazing fees and fines. Now, uh, in uh, 2014, the government finally decided to take action. They had actually uh, initially considered it in 2012, uh, but uh, they, uh, they viewed it as a potentially dangerous situation. Uh, but 2014, they, they went ahead and, and moved on it. And at that time, May of 2014, just to provide a little bit of context, Clive and Bundy owed more than a million dollars in unpaid fees. Okay, uh, up in Oregon, uh, where there were 1,100 grazing permit holders, that is 1,100 ranchers that uh, uh, graze their animals on public lands, uh, out of those 1,100, only 45 
were late on their payment as of 2014. And all 45 of those put together owed a little less than $19,000 in uh, past due payments. And of those 45, only two of them had unpaid fees more than uh, 60 days past due. In fact, uh, as of that year, the year that Bundy uh, owed over a million dollars, the total of all late fees for all grazing permits in the entire nation was $237,000. So in other words, he owed four times more than the whole rest of the country put together. So in the spring of 2014, the Bureau of Land Management uh, started rounding up Cliven Bundy's cattle that was on public land, uh, rounded a bunch of them up and, and pinned them up uh, and essentially said, uh, start working on making your payments and uh, maybe you'll get them back, which uh, he did not respond well to. And bear in mind, it wasn't a matter of him not having the money to pay year by year, although he might well not have had a million dollars once it got that far. But um, he refused to pay on principle. By the way, uh, I misspoke a second ago. I said that it was the uh, sovereign state movement. It's called the sovereign citizen movement. Bundy responded by sending letters uh, to various county and state officials and some federal officials asking for, for protection against this trampling of his rights by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, he also said that uh, he and his sons said that if someone comes on their property and takes their property, that's stealing. And the Constitution says you have the right to protect your property. Uh, so therefore, he was uh, uh, implying strongly, heavily, actually he was calling for an armed resistance to the BLM. And he also sent out, uh, sent out a call uh, to right-wing militias around the country to come and join him. He also uh, sent out a, a message, not individually, but uh, one big message to, to county sheriffs all around the country to, uh, to uh, detain and disarm federal officials uh, of various different federal agencies because they had no constitutional rights. Well, that didn't happen. But what did happen is that in response to Bundy sending out uh, by social media a call for, quote, a range war, end quote, a whole lot of people came and sort of uh, clustered around him and his family, including a lot of militia groups, such as uh, uh, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, and others, uh, if those names sound uh, familiar, they were heavily involved in the events on January 6, 2021, later on, as well as some smaller militias and a bunch of just individuals uh, who came to, uh, uh, to join in this fight. And uh, the, uh, uh, the BLM and their agents, as well as the uh, uh, ATF and the FBI and the uh, county and state police there from Nevada, they showed up and there was a standoff, an armed standoff. The, uh, uh, the federal agents and the police made the decision not to wear uh, riot or assault gear because that might seem provoking. Uh, instead, uh, as you can see, uh, there's, uh, there's one guy there with a bulletproof vest, but that was about the extent of it. There were about 50 of them and about 250 people uh, in, in Bundy's group. Uh, therefore, the, uh, the law enforcement officials were very reluctant to seem too aggressive uh, because uh, they had guns pointed at them. There were snipers uh, planted uh, there were um, uh, 
uh, several people that blocked off the interstate and back traffic up for miles and had uh, snipers stationed on overpasses. Uh, it was uh, it was a very tense standoff that eventually ended when the uh, the government authorities basically uh, backed away uh, and uh, uh, didn't really do anything. Uh, and then uh, I think Bundy got his cattle back. Even uh, there, uh, there was one couple, a married couple, who were here for this thing that uh, went north, uh, went northward to Las Vegas and got in a shootout with police, killed a couple of police and they got killed. Um, other than that, I don't think that there were uh, uh, there were any other incidents uh, like that, but it uh, it was very tense. And at any moment, it threatened to turn into uh, one of those uh, one of those range wars, like we talked about. In some ways, this was like <clears throat> kind of like when the uh, U.S. Army was called in in the Johnson County War, except in that case, uh, you know, they they came in and and arrest <clears throat> arrested a bunch of people, even though nothing came of it. Two years later, two of uh, Bundy's sons. Ammon and Ryan, I think, who had been present at the 2014 standoff, uh, heading up a group that they called uh, Citizens for Constitutional Freedom, occupied the uh, the headquarters, the government uh, park headquarters at the Mallard National Wildlife Refuge, and um, were under siege by the FBI for about 40 days. Uh, that siege uh, ended when a convoy carrying uh, Ammon Bundy, you see him there, uh, was was stopped by federal agents. He was arrested. One of the other cars uh, tried to break through the uh, uh, the, the roadblocks and uh, uh, one of them wound up being shot and killed. So um, my point in talking about this more recent stuff is that uh, no matter how you feel about it, uh, and no matter where your sympathies might lie uh, in this story, it definitely harkens back both to a lot of the attitudes that were present uh, in uh, ranchers in the uh, in the West uh, in the uh, 19th century, and it definitely uh, harkens back to a lot of the uh, legal and policy issues around public land. That's part of the reason that they occupied this National Wildlife Refuge, by the way. They didn't think that the federal government has the constitutional authority to make things like uh, national parks or, or wildlife refuges. So uh, anyhow, it's, it's fascinating how old history can sometimes uh, come to life again in a modern context.